Good morning, everyone. As John said, my name is Tom. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Yes, fantastic. All right. Today, I'm going to be talking about promises. It's an introduction to promises. So if you don't know anything about them, that's good. That's ideal. Um, is there anybody here who's already using promises? Yeah, a few hands go up. All right. That's good. Um, you're probably not going to learn very much, but thank you for coming anyway. <laughs> so... What actually is a promise? That's, here's a description in English. A promise is a generic way of structuring code that could take a long time to run and it might succeed or fail. In general, asynchronous programming can be painful and error handling in asynchronous programming can be even more painful. What promises offer us is a way to do this kind of programming that's a bit easier to understand and has less bugs. It's not really a big topic. Um, I'm hoping that we'll cover enough in this presentation that when you leave, you'll be able to start using promises in your apps right away if you want to. So here's a broad overview of what we're going to go over today. Most of the time when you see a promise, it's something that's being returned from a function. So in uh, the first part of the talk, we're going to talk about how you use uh, that promise um, in the, when you get one back from a function. After that, you're probably going to want to be able to create promises and return them from your own functions. So that's the topic of the second part. After that, we'll go on to chaining promises, and this is where promises get really awesome. Um, it's the best bit, but I won't say anything more about that just now. Promises, promises have been around for ages in various forms. Um, it's, they've existed for a long time. They've been implemented in many different programming languages. If it seems like you've heard more about them recently, it's probably because they were included in ECMAScript 2015, a recent edition of JavaScript. And as we know, since all software is written in JavaScript now, it's kind of a big deal. However, for today, we'll be using Swift 3 and a reasonably popular third-party library called PromiseKit, which happens to include bindings for both Swift and Objective-C. So we want to talk about consuming promises first. To make this more real, let's have an example app. We're going to build, or we have been building, a, a music player app for iOS. And when the user taps a button, they want to see the album art corresponding to the song that's currently playing. We might have a go at trying to do that using a function like this. We want to load the image from disk and then assign it to the image view. And because it might take a while, we might say, oh, we'll have an activity spinner on there that's going to start spinning when the load starts and then we'll stop it when the uh, when the load finishes and also it might fail so because you know it might try to find this album art on disk and it's just not there so we'll return a, a nil into our optional UI image and then we'll use a placeholder image instead if we couldn't actually get it but there's you know a, a few problems with this and most of them boil down to the fact that this load album art from disk might take a long time to run and because we're on the UI thread at this point in time, the whole app is going to be unresponsive. The um, activity spin is not even going to work. What we really want to do is push the loading of the image onto a background thread and then come back onto the UI thread just for long enough to assign the image to the view. If we were to do this with promises, it might look a bit more like this. We define a function that returns a promise UI image. And then we call it. And what we have here at a high level is three closures, three chunks of code that correspond to different actions. We have a then code. This is the success handler. It takes an image as its parameter. This is the code that runs if the request succeeded. We have a catch block. This is what runs if there was an error, if it failed to load the image. And we have an always block. This, is, this will happen, this will run when the promise finishes regardless of whether it was a success or a failure. And you can see how um, the tasks we wanted to do fall neatly into those different closures. You don't need to have all of these. You probably usually want to have a catch block there just to catch any errors, but I've included all three for an example. Now, I'm using a feature of Swift here that you might not be familiar with. Um, if a function ends, uh, if the parameters of a function ends with a closure, you can um, actually write the closure after the call. So when I write then parentheses and then a closure in braces, what I'm really doing is passing that closure as a parameter of the then function. So this is a fairly... Oop, dear me. Sorry, I've lost my mic there. How's that? Is that okay? Good. All right, this is a fairly simple example, but there's already a few nice things about it. One is that... 
we don't have to use optionals anymore. If we're in the then block, it's a success case, and we're given an unwrapped UI image ready to use. Also, uh, PromiseKit will run all of these closures on the UI thread by default, so it's no problem for us to interact with the uh, UI image view inside this block. Another nice thing is that we can catch errors, thrown errors from part of the request process here in this catch block without having to write do catch or try statements ourselves. It's all built into the promises, so that's quite tidy. A less obvious benefit, but a very important one, is that this entire chunk of code runs instantaneously. Now, what do I mean by that? We can take that and stick it inside a view controller method. The, when the user taps the button, what it will do is the thread comes in and it says, all right, load the image, and here's a list of instructions. If it succeeds, run this code. If it fails, run this code. And when you're finished, regardless of whether it succeeded or failed, run this code. I'm not going to hang around. See you later. And the function returns. Some point later, the request will finish, and it will just execute those closures. But it, your, your app remains responsive for the duration of that process. Most of the time, consuming a promise is as simple as that. And it's exactly the same for any type. It doesn't matter whether you're returning an image, a string, it could be a, a network socket, it could be a database record. The pattern of consuming the result is always the same. So we've got this promise object coming back, and we're calling methods on it. Let's have a bit of a closer look at what that actually means, what this promise object conceptually represents. A promise is connected with some task that's underway. Every single time we call load album art from disk, what we get back is a new instance of a promise. And that uh, is connected with that particular um, execution of the task. What it means is, I promise to give you a UI image. And the type comes from the type in angle brackets there, in this case, a UI image. You saw in the earlier example that our success handler the then took an image as its parameter, and that comes directly from the type of the promise that we're dealing with. If instead we had a promise string, then our corresponding then handler would have a string parameter instead. Promises are in one of two states. When you, when you first create them, the work is still in progress, so they're said to be pending. At some point later, the work will finish, and it transitions to the resolved state. And hopefully, at this point, you have your UI image or whatever it is you're hoping to get. But what if it fails? What if it tries to load some file from disk and it's just not there? We haven't produced a UI image. We've produced some swift error instead. So we handle this by having two ways of transitioning from the pending state to the resolved state. We can either fulfill the promise, meaning that we got the thing that we wanted, or we reject the promise, which means that, well, we didn't, sorry, we didn't actually get it, but here's an error case you can handle if you want to. As soon as it gets into that, then st uh, that fulfilled state or that rejected state, it then runs the corresponding then handlers or reject handlers, and the always handlers. You might be wondering at this point, what happens if the promise resolves really quickly? What if we, you know, we call into this load album art from disk, and it's already cached; it already has the UI image. So by the time we come back and we attach our then and our catch, it's al it's already f finished. Uh, uh, Will our code actually run? And the answer is yes. Uh, the promise will treat it exactly the same as if it hadn't happened yet. So if, if you attach a then to an already fulfilled promise, it will run it immediately. If you attach a catch to an already rejected promise, then that will happen immediately. So most of the time, you actually don't have to care whether it's pending or not. You just attach your handlers, and it's all good. The promise has got you back. So for those who like to keep track, that was the end of part one, all about consuming promises. Now we're going to look at how we create promises and return them from our own functions. Exactly the way you do this depends on the kind of asynchronous task that you want to return from, so we're going to look at a few different scenarios. This is one way that we could write the load album art from disk um, function. In this case, we are invoking the init method of a promise object directly um, and passing in a fairly large closure. We don't need that resolvers thing in the parentheses, so let's take them out. Now yeah, that's a bit cleaner. So this closure is going to be executed here and now on the current thread when we create the promise. And this closure takes two parameters called fulfill and reject. These fulfill and reject are actually themselves closures. They're things that we call when we're finished. Um, we call fulfill with the thing that we have successfully loaded or we call reject with the error that has occurred. And when we do that, the promise is resolved.
The key thing about this example is that we are using fulfill and reject right here in this closure. We're, set, we're setting up some task using fulfill and reject and returning the promise from our function. And this actually works fine, and this is a good layout, a good structure to use for synchronous code. You can do something similar when you're using a function that has success and failure callbacks. In this case, you set up some request, and in your on success block, you simply use your fulfill, and in your on failure block, you use your reject. When you do this, you're effectively translating it from a, from a callback interface to a promise interface, which on the face of it might seem like a waste of time and code, but it allows you to use promise chaining, which we'll get to later and we'll see is totally worth your time. Next, let's look at something very different, an album art loader delegate, a delegate pattern. Now, you see these all the time if you're coding using the Coco APIs. So we've got this class which owns an album art loader, and it's got a couple of delegate methods which the loader will call. To make this example as realistic as possible, I gave them unnecessarily long names. Loader did load album art, loader did fail to load album art. And what we want to do is create some load album art function that returns a promise UI image, exactly the same thing that we had before, except it's going to somehow wrap this entire delegate process. How do we do that? This is what that looks like. We create our promise as usual, but instead of using fulfill and reject immediately, then and there in the closure, we save them in properties of the class for later. I'll mention, by the way, that this will only work if you have one request pending at a time, but it's good for an example. And once we've saved that fulfill and reject for later, we, call, uh, we tell the loader to do its job. We expect it to call the delegate method shortly um, with either a success or a failure. Inside those delegate methods, we take the fulfill or the reject that we saved away earlier and execute it with either the successful result, the UI image, or the failure case, the error. So now even this fairly complicated delegate system can be wrapped in a promise UI image uh, function exactly the same as the earlier examples and can be called using exactly the same code that we looked at in the first part. We've looked at three different ways of uh, creating promises here. The rule is that you have to call, fulfill, or reject, just one of them once. Exactly how you go about it doesn't really matter. I should mention at this point that it's possible to create pre-resolved promises. Um, you can create a promise that is already resolved with a particular value, it's fulfilled, or you can create a promise that's already resolved with a particular error, it's been rejected. Um, I don't have time now to go into detail why this is useful, but when you write some conditional code it is, and it's really useful to know that they exist. So that's the end of part two. Now we know all about how to consume promises and also how to create them. If all you're trying to do is sort of make a clean and consistent API inside your app for writing your asynchronous uh, requests, this is possibly all you need to know, but you'd be missing out because chaining is the best bit. For today, we're going to focus on having multiple then handlers. Yes, that's right. We've only had one then so far, but we're going to have more of them now. We've got this function that we've written, it could be any of the ones that we were looking at, load album art from disk, and it's returning a promise at UI image. Suppose that we don't actually care about the image itself, we just want to know how many pixels are in it. I don't know why, we just do. It's the width times the height, it's just a number. So really we want another function, number of pixels in album art that returns a promise int. It's going to take some time to calculate this, and when it finishes it's going to return an int. Then we have a view controller method that can call this. It can say number of pixels in album art, and when that's finished, it can use that however it wants. So this is the data flow that we're looking at. We're going to load the album art from disk, it's returning UI image view, we've got some other function that's going to process that result into a promise int and return that to the view controller. And the most important aspect of this is that the first two steps are merged into one. The view controller code doesn't even realize that it's loading an image first and then doing the number of pixels. It, all it wants to know is, okay, find the number of pixels and tell me when that's done. And that keeps the code uh, quite small and clean. So we need to write this number of pixels function in the middle, and this is what that would look like. The first thing we're going to do is load the album art, because we can't find the number of pixels until we have the image. Once we have it, in the then block, in the success handler, we will calculate the number of pixels and return it. Now hang on a minute. Previously, we were returning void from our then closure. Now we're returning an int. When we do that, that means that the return type of the then call 
is a promise int. Now, if you haven't worked with generics much in Swift, this might be a bit confusing to you, so I'm going to spend a bit of a, a, take a minute to explain this in full. Let's add some more types in here and break it out a bit. First thing we do is load the album art from disk, and that gives us a promise UI image. We're going to call then on that promise, and we're going to pass in a closure that returns an int. That means that the return type of the then call is a promise int. Those have to match. And if you look at the definition of the then function, you can see that this is actually codified in there. We've got some closure we're passing in. It's taking a type T as its parameter. In our case, that's a UI image. It's returning a type U, which is a type int. And that means that the whole call to then has to return a promise U, which is going to be a promise int. This means I actually glossed over something in our earlier example. When we first had our then catch and always, we were returning a void there, which means that this entire top block, the then block, is returning a promise void. When we get down to attaching our catch handler and our always handler, it's not even a promise UI image anymore, it's a promise void. Turns out that doesn't matter because they're not actually using the value. So this is a pretty cool thing. We can build up a pipeline, a processing pipeline, if you like, of uh, functions that pass data along to each other. They could be the same type, they could be a different type, and you can easily split them off at arbitrary points, make that a function boundary and say, all right, I want to request this bit of data at this point in the pipeline. If any of those happens to throw an error, then that will cause any of the subsequent then handlers in the chain to be skipped over until you reach the catch block. Now, you have to be a bit careful here because all of these are running on the UI thread by default, which means if one of these things is doing a heavy bit of processing, it's going to make your app unresponsive. Here's one way you can fix that. There's actually a parameter you can pass to then, specifying which dispatch queue you want this particular closure to run on. So here, we're loading the album out from the disk, and then we're doing, we're enhancing the image. I don't know what that means, but it's going to take a lot of CPU time. So we don't want to do it on the main thread. We're going to, do, we're going to put it on the global dispatch queue, and um, it will return an image. So that passes a, a different UI image down to uh, the final then block, which will be on the UI thread, and we'll place it in the view. And we can do this without having to write our own dispatch um, sync async stuff, which makes things really tidy. All right. Take a quick breather. That was a lot of closures and a lot of code. I'm going through a lot of examples today because I want you to get a feel for what, what it's like to work with promises and to see the kinds of problems that you can solve. I want to go over one more, one more example today, um, something really useful, which is when you have two asynchronous requests, one after the, the other, that you want to chain together. So let's upgrade our music player app. So that we have some song that we're playing. It has an artist and a title, and we want to show the album art. And we're going to be downloading that album art from some URL, but we don't know what the URL is. So we're going to do this as a series of two requests. In the first request, we're going to do a search on the server. We're going to say, hey, we're playing this song. Can you give us some metadata about it? And if it knows the song, the server will send back a JSON blob which contains the metadata. Inside that JSON, Amongst other things, it will include the URL of the album art that we have to download. So we'll take that URL out of the JSON, and we'll then post a second request. And that will return a JPEG image that we can then assign to our image view. And you can see that this is all, even though there's multiple steps, this is really one uh, process that we want to just say in our view controller, oh, hey, going, here's the artist and the title. Please go and find our uh, image that we can assign to our view. So we can do this with promises. We'll split out the first two steps, step one and step two, into their own functions. First one, download song metadata. It takes two string parameters, and it's going to provide a promise JSON, because it's sending us back the metadata. Then in the second step, we're going to download the album art. We have to give it the URL that we already have by this stage, and we're going to return a promise UI image. Now this is the function that ties them together. In the first case, in the first step, we're going to kick off our metadata download, and we need to do something when that metadata successfully downloads. So we attach a then block. Inside that then block, we grab our JSON object and extract the URL somehow. This is not real code, but you get the idea. 
Once you have that extracted URL, you can then pass it into the download album art function as its parameter. And in here, what we do is we return that promise UI image from inside our then block. Now, I want to be really clear about this. In the, in the very first example, our then block returned a void type. Then a little bit later on, we had an example where it returned an int, which transformed it into a promise int. Now we're returning a promise from, it, from inside then. It's a promise UI image. And this is handled specially. What this does is it inserts that new promise into the chain at this point. Processing of the, this chain will pause at this point, and it will wait for the new promise to complete and insert it into the chain. What this means is, because this new promise is going to return a UI image, the next U, uh, UI image, sorry, the next then block in the chain will expect to receive a UI image. So this is really cool. We've taken like, this moderately complicated two-step data flow and represented it in not very much code. That's quite easy to use. And what's more, the error handling in this is very convenient. Suppose we send up some artist and title and the server doesn't recognize the song. It, does, it can't actually give us back any metadata. That will cause the first promise to be rejected, the download song metadata promise to be rejected. When that happens, the two then blocks will be skipped over and we'll go straight down to the catch block and we'll show our placeholder. This means that we never even attempt to download the album art for some URL that we don't have. It's just handled automatically by the chaining of the promises. And also, if the album art failed to download, even though we got the metadata, we would skip over just this then block down to the catch, and again, we'd hit exactly the same error handling code and show the placeholder. So that takes us to the end of part three. That's chaining. I think it's really cool. Um, we've used this stuff a ton at work. It's made our code a lot cleaner. So let's recap what we covered today, and hopefully you can start to use some of this. In the first part, we looked at the basics of consuming promises. You call a function, you get a promise object back, you can attach then the success handler, catch the failure handler, and always, if you don't mind whether it succeeded or failed, you just attach whichever ones are relevant. In the second part, we looked at how you create promises and return them. You initialize a promise and you're given fulfill and reject, and your duty is to call one of them once. That's the only thing that matters. We looked at a few ways you can do that. And in the third part, we looked at two different ways of doing chaining. In the first part, we added extra synchronous work onto the end of the image. We processed it into a, an integer value, the number of pixels inside it. And we did that by returning an int from the then block, which transformed it into a promise int. Then after that, we looked at chaining two asynchronous tasks together, where one, the second task is dependent on data from the first task. And we did that by returning a promise from inside the then block, which inserted it into the chain and made it wait there for that second uh, task to finish before we ended up using the result. So some tips to finish off. If you want to use PromiseKit in your own project, that's quite easy to do. You can use either Carthage or CocoaPods. Um, if you find yourself running into compilation errors, one of the best things to do is specify the extra types explicitly on your closures. Sometimes Swift type inference gets it wrong. Sometimes my brain's type inference gets it wrong. Either way, writing out the types explicitly usually solves the problem. PromiseKit has some cool features in it, um, some cool wrappers, some stuff for Cocoa, which I have not shown here. If you're interested in this, please go visit their website, promisekit.org, and have a look at their docs. And you should also be aware that PromiseKit is different from JavaScript promises. Um, the concepts are the same, but the syntax is a fair bit different. So you've just got to be a bit careful when you're bouncing between platforms. If you would like to use the, um, uh, the code I've put in this, you can put that, you can download the PDF which I've uploaded here, and I'm happy to answer questions at any point during DevWorld or after if you would like to know more about this. Thank you very much. Hello. Anyone have any questions immediately? Yep. So if you throw the arrow, so you only have one catch. Yes. So how could you know which then throw okay. which key? Yeah. 
Yeah, good question. Okay, so the question was, if you throw an error in the middle of the pipeline, how do you know which, uh, which thing caused the error? And uh, the answer is, you can uh, throw a custom error. If I sort of run back here, um, where did I do this? A catch. Here's a catch block. So you can see that in the catch block, you're actually receiving the error that was thrown. So you can define your own custom enum here, and you can include parameters in that. So that's, that, that's the best way to know um, which error actually occurred. Any more questions? Yeah, go for it. So in the, in the example that you had when you uh, try to get a value out from the JSON dictionary, yep. um, can we throw an error at that point and let it be catched by the, the catch block later down in the pipeline? Yes, absolutely. Um, the question there was, if we, when we're passing the JSON, um, I emitted some error handling there, um, this might fail. Uh, because we might fail to get the JSON string out, or it might not parse as a URL or whatever. Can we throw at that point to um, trigger the catch to happen? And the answer is yes. At any point in the chain, you throw an error, um, that behaves exactly the same way, and you hit the catch block. And um, yeah, that, that, I find that really convenient. I think we might wrap it up there. I've about out of time. So thank you all for coming along. Thank <laughs> you.